My name is John Doe Bell and I'm the Oceania Managing Partner for Strategic Growth Markets for Ernst & Young. Um, in that role, my responsibility looks at working with market leaders of the future. So realistically, my role is about looking into the marketplace in Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, and making sure that we're doing everything we can to identify companies that will be market leaders in their relevant market sectors or on the index as a whole, um, and that over the next two, three, five, ten years that we work with those companies as they grow. How one becomes a strategist, I think uh, it's not something you wake up and, and become one day, it's something that you find having lived through different ways of thinking and working. Uh, there's probably an element of osmosis and the, the fortune or misfortune of the people that you might tend to work with on the way through. Um, but I think there are some underlying skills or talents, I suppose is the way to describe it, that. Um, perhaps are allowed to bloom or flourish, uh, depending on who you're mentored by and how you move through that process. I think the key um, sort of underlying talents or skills uh, come back to probably two or three main ones. One, one's a real inquisitiveness for, for things that are going on, not accepting the status quo for things, but asking what if or why or why not. Um, so quite often you'll find people who are very good in a, in a strategy sense will take the input or listen to all the different points of view, but they'll actually say, why not? Why don't we do it a different way? So there's that real inquisitiveness. Um, and I guess one of the other ones that sort of ties into that is an ability to actually seek input from all different dimensions, all different facets, whether constructive in a positive manner or a non-positive manner, uh, and actually take the, the silver linings, if you like, out of all of those different sets of inputs uh, and be able to distill what is it that makes the difference in a sense and then really build something out of that. My educational background um, I guess is, you know, has been predominantly Australian and Sydney based coming through um, you know, state schools here and then at a tertiary level um, studying both um, commerce with an accounting major and law and, and sort of uh, qualifying in both of those. But um, I, I guess the learnings I brought from going through those sort of heavily analytical type uh, uh, coursework, if you like, uh, was tempered with um, the running of my own businesses on the way through um, uh, whilst I was studying, particularly in a, in a tertiary sense, um, all of which were at that stage aligned with sort of information technology and um, you know, the emergence of sort of computing in the home at that point and helping people build and, and analyse it. So, so there's sort of a combination of learnings that come from that practical, uh, interactional, entrepreneurial activity, if you like, on its own, uh, along with the, the learnings that come through um, at that, that tertiary level. From my point of view, heroes from a strategy point of view, um, they're far less the, the brand name uh, individuals or, or those that uh, you know, you'd put up there on a mantle as, as having points of view or changing the, the thinking in that. Um, and they probably had much more of a personal impact to me. So those people who I've worked with, who I've been able to look at and say, actually that way of thinking makes sense to me. I can see how that individual assesses information and what they do with it. And I've been able to see over a period of time the impact of that. So, you know, those people range from clients that I've worked with and looking at how they work in their organisation through to, you know, even learning from family members about how things have been done in family business environments. So very much, uh, it's very personal, I guess, from my point of view. The most important disciplines and learning for me um, in, in terms of coming to a strategist uh, or taking, I guess, a strategic approach to things, because it's pretty rare you sit there and think of yourself necessarily as a strategist. Um, but they have been that ability to, to assimilate and take on thoughts and ideas, but remain yourself. So, um, uh, you know, I, I guess the learnings I've had have been a conglomeration of inputs from analysis of other organisations and individuals and all of those sorts of things. Um, but if I don't continue to drive them in the way that I think and work and operate, uh, then I'm never going to be able to stand by my belief and movements as I move forward. So there's a, there's a, strong, a strong learning in my part, which is that, you know, taking those things on, but being yourself and thinking through things the way you have to think and operate is, is probably the biggest part of it. Maybe one of the better ways to define it is by analogy in terms of 
you know, your strategy is the long-term goal of getting to the top of the mountain or whatever the, the outcome is and, you know, your tactics are what you're going to do on the way through. So from my point of view, I define strategy as that, that long-term view, that vision, that, that I won't say end point because I don't think there's ever an end point in terms of how you apply it, but, but the, the seeing over the hill and wanting to know where you want to get to over that hill and, and having a, a degree of focus that helps you get there. Organisations, if they don't have a strategy, are finding it more and more difficult not only to capture hearts and minds of their clients and customers, but also their people. I mean, organisations that have a very clear, easy to understand strategy at the highest level of what they want to do are far more likely to be able to get that feeling of community and everyone moving in the one direction and, you know, reward being a combination of dollar-based outcomes but also personal satisfaction from having an achievement of doing something. So you look at um, many of our not-for-profit organisations um, across the area, um, you know, their strategy is very crystal clear in terms of what they want to do and how they want to achieve it. And their challenges are invariably in the day-to-day -day execution of that and how they move forward. Um, you know, 50 years ago perhaps uh, you might say organisations didn't have a strategy. Well, perhaps they couldn't enunciate what that strategy was, but someone somewhere in that organisation, whether from an entrepreneurial background or otherwise, would have had their view and their vision of where they want to get to. And I guess it's the layers of how one talks about that and how one describes it that um, allows those companies to actually move forward rather than perhaps meander in circles, which I guess is the, uh, the sort of the counter of just doing tactical things for the sake of doing tactical things. Entrepreneurial strategies, I think if you try and distinguish them from a broader, what you might call a corporate strategy or whatever it might be, um, there's probably a couple of things that come out. One is, uh, and this is a trait from an entrepreneurial background generally, a high degree of, of passion in terms of what you do. Um, so the entrepreneurs that we deal with, passion comes number one, and then number two come you know, various other bits and pieces depending on their business area. Mm -hmm. And that reflects in terms of the strategy of what they put in place. So their, their strategy will come from the heart, number one, and then the practical components might, might sort of follow on from that in, in part of what happens. So that, that's sort of an element of it. Mm -hmm. I think the, the second part of it is an entrepreneurial strategy will generally have a higher degree of cloudiness, if that's the right way to put it, uh, the further into the future you go. So a corporate strategy, you will have uh, a need, whether through stakeholders, whatever it might be, to, to perhaps you know, have an expectation of having a clearer outcome of what will five years look like or what will three years look like. With an entrepreneurial strategy, there's that need to remain more nimble, to move. You know, you can see where you're going, you know how you basically want to get there, but we're going to remain a little bit flexible about how we deal with that. Uh, and if you take that flexibility away, you go to the heart of taking away something that's entrepreneurial. You take away that ability to, to innovate on the way through, basically. How businesses move forward when the entrepreneur moves on is one of the, I guess it's one of the key issues that, that I face in my sort of day-to-day -day interaction with clients. Um, entrepreneurs do pick up and drive organisations forward. And if you look at, certainly from an Australian context, some of the you know, publicly known families that have gone through a number of generations of entrepreneurial talent, so the Packer family or you know others like that, you can see different generational approaches. But what that highlights is, if you like, the entrepreneur, the original entrepreneur having a plan, a succession plan for how they see the business going and who they think should pick it up and take it forward. Um, it's very difficult though for many entrepreneurs to think about that succession approach and what they should do when they're still in the throes and the passion of driving the business to where they want to take it. Uh, so I think it, it's, actually, it's actually quite difficult and you do see a number of entrepreneurial businesses that have gone through generation one flounder in generation two potentially because there hasn't been that, that level of focus. I don't think there's any silver bullet answer to that um, other than a good entrepreneur who also has a good understanding of the outcome of what they're building as opposed to just the vision that they're living uh, will take the time and effort to source the right individuals and people and recognise their limitations as someone who can pick up and grow a business to a certain stage but perhaps not someone who can flip it into that sustainable long-term corporate um, outcome. Where you've got um, a very strong uh, patriarch involved in the business or, and has come through and built it from day one to, to ongoing 
um, it, it is very difficult with those businesses and those individuals to explain, okay, perhaps once you've moved on, this is what's going to happen, here's your family structure, how are you actually going to work now to set up something that either provides for those individuals or has the long-term sustainability of the business at heart, or perhaps both. Um, even when we look from an Australian context, we'll look at those entrepreneurs who, who in our minds are you know, champions of entrepreneurship. They've been driving businesses for the last 40, 50 years and are getting to that stage. Um, we had a meeting in, in Perth with sort of five individuals about six months ago to talk through, and these are people who've built you know, multi-million, million dollar businesses mm -hmm. that are looking at where do they take them. And they each had a different mindset as to how they were going to approach it. Some were saying, I don't have a view or a, a level of um, belief that my family members are the right people to be involved for the business going forward. So in fact, I'll go through an exit process recognising that's difficult for me at the moment, but recognising it provides for my family in the best way that they're possible to deal with by setting them up with the right future revenue or whatever it might be. Whereas others have taken a different view and said, actually, the skill base of the individuals in my family do fit what we're trying to do and I'll bring my family members in and, and help drive it forward. But it, it, it is a difficult one, but I think it's, um, you know, as, as, as the entrepreneurs move through their careers, if they have been successful in continuing to grow an organisation, uh, they learn sufficient lessons on the way through to recognise that this isn't the be all and end all then for them. This is now a family business that they've structured that they need to do something with to preserve either the business or their family or both. The future of entrepreneurs, I mean, it's an interesting one to look at. I mean, if you go back over the last sort of, you know, 30, 40 years, um, you know, the nature of our world was such that entrepreneurship wasn't really an option in a lot of countries. So we have seen massive changes in the last, you know, number of decades that that have released entrepreneurial spirit, if you like. Um, so what will it look like in 10, 15 years? A little bit of crystal ball gazing going on there, but um, you know, I think the nature of our business world is such that pressures are generally increasing on things, but entrepreneurs by their nature are people who juggle pressures all the time. Uh, one of the questions I get asked a lot at the moment is, well, has uh, the current economic climate impacted on what entrepreneurs are doing and how their business is moving forward? Well, yeah, sure it has, but an entrepreneur wakes up every day with a mountain of challenges to climb over. This is just another one to add to it. Uh, and, and I suspect what we will see in the business environment is a continuation of just more challenges coming in. Um, true entrepreneurial spirit will take those, uh, look at them in a glass half full manner and continue to move on and, and move around them. Uh, so I think the entrepreneurial talent globally and in our area in the next 10 or 15 years will just continue to, to pick up and move that forward. Um, I guess one of the other practical overrides to that though is you know, the last decade has seen a need for entrepreneurial talent to be global in its mindset from day one, uh, which never really existed previously. Um, and if I look at the organisations we deal with that are that are really growing and really pushing forward, they might be located in Australia or New Zealand or Indonesia, but they might have 95% of their client base outside of those countries. Um, and, and that's been supported by changes in you know, general infrastructure and internet based things, but also broader communication interactions. So uh, I think the entrepreneur of the future will continue to have that resilience and approach, um, but we'll need to you know, leverage those sorts of changes more as they come through as well. The way that one focuses on the driving of um, innovation from a strategic point of view is to allow the flexibility, if you like, within strat the strategic approach for that to happen. So again, if you come back and think of, I guess what we observe on a regular basis around entrepreneurs and how they set strategy for their organisations versus a more pure strategic approach at the corporate end for things, um, there's that level of flexibility and assessment and, and um, I, I suppose, um, you know, outside thinking that actually supports and drives those sorts of outcomes. So, uh, you know, in terms of those that are responsible for setting the strategic direction of corporations and, and then ultimately business units that are operating within them and those sorts of things, I think that element of, of, of flexibility and thinking needs to be there, but not such that it compromises the vision and the outcome of the organisational business unit. Um, if you don't have 
have that flexibility, and I guess I'm using that term reasonably loosely, but that ability to, to move around and think differently and shuffle stuff, uh, you do stifle that innovation. And I guess you know, um, pretty clear evidence that we see from our organisations that we work with, if you don't have that level of innovation there, uh, if you don't recognise the risks that are being taken and if you don't reward both the taking of the risk and the outcome, whether positive or negative at the end of the day, um, you'll end up with a very sterile approach to how you move forward and your organisation will, will not flourish as a result. Organisations that are, that are setting themselves up, if you like, to base themselves on um, innovation as the way of moving forward, I guess it brings from day one a higher degree of risk on a whole bunch of commercial things that, um, that perhaps organisations that are a little um, less innovative or more mainstream in their approach uh, would face. So even simple things like gaining access to capital. Um, if I'm someone that's got a fantastic idea and an innovative approach to something, it's quite often a hell of a lot more difficult for me to argue my case to get resources and support for me to take that forward. Um, unless, you know, it's, it's sort of an iron cast outcome. Um, and particularly in the current global economic climate, even more so, those that have the sources of capital being far more discreet about where they actually put those. Um, and innovation might be a great thing, but I'll just wait and see how it pans out. Mm -hmm. So I think you've got that start-up risk that, um, you know, without either defined industry supports or venture capital mechanisms that, that, that really recognise and are comfortable taking that risk, you know, that, that, that's issue number one, if you like. If you manage to overcome that because of the nature of the innovation, so, you know, clean technology is a good example where um, solar thermal might be um, a less uh, robust but more innovative outcome than, say, wind farms in, in how you move things forward. Um, everyone recognises that, but getting the hurdle for funding is, is, is a difficult part. If you get that part of it in place, I think the ongoing challenge becomes one of preserving that culture of innovation moving forward. Um, uh, you know, setting out your, your strategies being built and based on innovation is the start of a lot of good organisations, thoughts and ideas, but as the organisations grow, certainly in our experience, the ability to preserve that innovative culture as you build the organisation's infrastructure is a real issue. Um, you know, someone like a Google is the good example of how to continue that. They start off innovation, they build off innovation, they still drive that way going forward. But there are plenty of examples of organisations that started with a great innovative idea driving their strategy, um, who've become far less innovative and more corporate in their, in their structure and over time um, the attractiveness of that to the people who start up and get involved dissipates. Um, the ability to gain the sort of um, differential returns for those that invest in it dissipate as well. A high level of innovative ideas might crash and burn, but if they're successful, they are a true market differentiator for those organisations and have returns that show that. How do we preserve the future of the organisation? It's great now that we work with large corporates and we have some great relationships that, that uh, drive the firm's outcomes today, but um, how do I ensure that in five years' time we're working with the right organisations and we have the right people coming through the organisation to do that? So there's an element of you know, longer term investment around that, there's an element of um, a high element of strategic alignment and review of what we do and there's a high degree of uh, accumulation of data and information that helps us form those views. Now that's you know, both hard data around well, what is it that businesses are doing, which ones are heading where and what are we seeing in the market and how are you know, the changes in even recent things like the dollar and um, resource exports impacting what our market mix looks like. But it's also an element of, well, who are we actually engaging with? And, you know, is it the individual that's driving that business irrespective of whether they happen to be working in a resources sector or two years later in retailing or another year later somewhere else? You know, what is it that's, that's driving that part of it? And that's the that's, I guess, the soft element of it, the networked element, the, the visibility of, um, you know, what is it at, at, at the heart of the individuals that are driving things forward. So when we sit back and look at, okay, our strategy is we want to work with the largest corporations in five years' time, we do that through a whole pile of analytics of particular information that might be publicly available, but we also do it through a lot of assessment of, you know, soft data around, well, given that I've met that organisation, I've seen how they work, I've 
taken a view on their values and how they approach diversity and where I think those things are going, they're all a little bit harder to, to assess, but they're all equally valid data in, in me feeling comfortable at the end of the day that we've picked the right strategy in how we'll move forward. Uh, and I think our organisations, um, particularly the entrepreneurial ones, um, probably adopt a similar combination of approaches when they go out and look at where it is they want to head. One of the ways that, that we will try to encourage that innovation within the organisation um, is by structured mechanisms that help do that. So, you know, if you're, if you're used to doing things in a structured manner and you've got certain things in place, all right, well, for the next three hours, we're having some structured, unstructured time. Let's talk about the ideas. Let's have a pitch fest, get things out there. Let's not have any critiques in place. Let's just note it down the 40 or 50 things that come out and then we'll, we'll work our way through them. I mean, that's a simple example, but it's one that, you know, helps to bring back the, the sense of doing that sort of thing. Um, you know, and there are other examples, again, that we use across the organisations that, that aren't unique to us of, um, you know, coming back in terms of bringing ideas up to management, putting them out there irrespective of where they come from. Um, taking challenges that the organisation's finding and turning those around and saying, well, you know, we are a, an organisation of intellectual um, powerhouse of individuals, what are your thoughts around this? Um, and seeking that input. So, so there's sort of a two-way level of, of interaction that helps drive that. In terms of how we consult with clients around strategy, I mean, it's um, in a lot of instances the sort of services we provide into our clients are helping them actually execute on their strategy once they've got to that point. Um, but a lot of times when we come in at that stage we will find that perhaps things have been not missed necessarily but um, you know there might be other experiences we've had in other organisations that we'd like to bring back and, and work them through. So that can start from ideas as simplistically as well Okay, if your strategy as an organisation is you need to continue to grow to, to get to a certain point of view, you've had great organic growth for the last three or four years, um, have you actually thought about acquisitional things, joint ventures, alliances, uh, let's talk to you about how we see those working and operating, let's highlight a few people that you might want to connect with in our networks to do that. Mm -hmm. so, so there are some, again, they're readily simplistic things, but um, they're not things that are always thought of when you're in the throes of trying to grow your own business. Uh, as it were, but you know, when you when you look at what transforms organisations, you know, those sort of alliance events are, are, are pretty significantly up there in terms of, of outcomes around it. So, uh, you know, it's looking at those sorts of opportunities where we've got breadth of experience that perhaps our clients might not have had that opportunity to see, and trying to embed that back into whatever strategy they might have already developed and helping to flesh that out for them. Getting um, our clients network together is probably certainly in, in the space that we're working in, in terms of growing organisations that are leaders of the future, it's, if not the number one thing, it's pretty close to it. Um, you know, organisations that are trying to move themselves through from a, maybe a, a one-person entrepreneurial start through to, to, you know, corporations of the future, they're not, most of them, almost all of them, but mo certainly most of them aren't going to do that by organic growth alone. Um, and, th and that alliance interaction and, and the challenge and innovation that comes from that is, is a really key part of it. Um, you know, without that, you might have a great idea of an organisation that gets to a certain size and, and plateaus. And a lot of people are comfortable with that. Um, you know, they might have a great business at that point and they're happy with it at the size it is and happy with the way it moves forward. That's fantastic. Um, and, and those businesses will no doubt sort of continue on for some period of time until there's a, another catalyst event one way or the other to change their market or change the players in their market or whatever it might be. But, uh, but those that want to continue to grow, that, that network and um, broking role is a really critical part of it. One of the learnings I've had over time around what a typical day should look like and what it does look like um, are often two different things. And reminding yourself of what your day should look like uh, is almost an hourly uh, activity. Certainly my plans for the day are to uh, ensure, that, ensure that I have enough time that I just call thinking time. You know, if you don't have the time to sit back and digest all of the bits that come through on a, a weekly and daily basis, you'll miss things. Uh, and you'll wake up a month later and go, why did I not see that? How did I not know what was coming through? So uh, again, <laughs> 
structuring in unstructured time in my daily schedule is an important important thing for me and important thing for the organisation to ensure that I'm going through. Um, and out of that come all sorts of ideas and, and, and arrangements, some of which are tactical in nature, but, but a lot of which go to changing how we approach our organisation. I think that sort of the, the second component of my day is then really made up of um, spending the time interacting with those that you know, I work with, um, both in a sort of a you know, check up on how are things going on an execution basis, but, but to bring that challenge from a, um, a going forward basis. You know, again, all right, well, we've had some good outcomes in these sectors or these areas or on these initiatives, but should we still be doing that? Why are we doing it? Have you thought about how these sorts of factors that we've seen in that industry might impact why we want to continue to invest there? So, so I guess you know, that's another large part of my day is, is, is dealing with that. Um, and, and then I guess the, the sort of the third part of it, certainly from my perspective in the organisation, is if I'm not out there talking to our clients and meeting our clients on a regular basis, I don't know what their challenges are or where they're heading and, and how I can embed that back in. Uh, so ensuring I've got a lot of uh, touch points with our, our clients, even if it's just to see where their business is up to and what's happening is, is sort of a part of it. Um, but they're, they're sort of the, the three things that make up the what should my day look like. Um, quite often it's, it's very easy to get pulled back into uh, things that other people think are important uh, as opposed to things which are actually important to you operating across the business and not being pulled into it. The single best bit of advice for today's students for tomorrow's strategists is um, I think it's got to be keep your mind open. I mean, it's, um, there can be so many pieces of advice around do this, learn that, follow these things, absorb stuff, but um, you know, I think the real skill of listening and pulling out the key points, keeping that mind open and actually absorbing stuff, but not doing it to the point that um, stunts your ability to move forward. It's got to be that, that key piece of advice. And I think that advice holds people in good stead, whether it's in a, um, you know, a learning environment or a business environment, whatever it might be. The, the experiences I've had working with organisations, those that have had people driving their strategy that have had that point of view in place uh, have been the ones that have They've kept their view of where they're going, but they've nimbly moved their way through as they need to. So I think that's probably, probably my number one piece of advice.